I'd like to welcome everyone to the Buyer Basics Layman's Seminar Series. Um, it seems that there's a great turnout, not surprisingly, for today's speaker. Uh, my name is Steve Smale. I've the, been the Vice Dean for Research in the School of Medicine uh, for the past five months now, and, and hopefully for a little while longer. Um, first, I wanted to thank um, everyone who, who has made this event possible, including the, the Research Administrators Campus Committee um, and UCLA Development, who really was the, the organization who, who developed the concept and, and began the interest in organizing the, um, the Buyer Basic series, and also the Office of Research Administration for the continuous support of the series. Uh, and also, really, just thanks to, to everyone who's here, the, the research administrators, because it's really uh, um, all of your work that makes it possible for us to do research and for uh, all of the accomplishments that, that Ming will be describing today. Um, I also wanted to announce before we begin that, that today is the, the inaugural RAC Open House, which will immediately follow the, the lecture. And so it's an information session for, uh, for RAC. I think it's on the poster over there. So for those who are, are able and willing to or interested in, in remaining, uh, um, I encourage everyone to, to do that. <clears throat> and so I'd really like to welcome uh, Dr. Ming Guo, who is today's um, seminar speaker. I've known uh, Ming for a long time, so it's very easy to, uh, to give this introduction. Uh, Ming is one of our real leading uh, uh, physicians and physician scientists at UCLA. Uh, she got her MD degree in, in China and then moved to UCSF uh, um, for postdoctoral studies, uh, for, for PhD studies uh, um, um, in basic science and, and in, a, in the Drosophila field. Um, after her work at uh, obtaining her PhD at UCSF, uh, we were very fortunate that about 15 years ago she moved to UCLA uh, for her residency and also for postdoctoral training in the laboratory of, of Larry Sapersky in the Department of Biological Chemistry, another one of our, our truly outstanding uh, um, laboratories on campus. Um, we were fortunate that, that Ming's chosen to remain here and, and has risen through the ranks and is now a professor in the, um, in the neurology department and also in the um, molecular medical pharmacology departments. Um, Ming's research really focuses on the study of the molecular uh, basis of neurodegeneration uh, with an emphasis on diseases like Parkinson's disease uh, and Alzheimer's disease. And I think what's, what's really uh, um, striking and innovative about uh, Ming's work is that all of it is done um, using uh, Drosophila as a model organism for studying those diseases. And I think this is really notable, uh, especially for this particular community, because this is the type of thing that you might see coming out in a, a congressional press release at some point. Um, where a, a congressman is trying to, to promote all of the waste in government spending and the, the need to cut back and will say, how ridiculous is this that we're actually uh, using uh, um, tax dollars to support uh, um, research on trying to understand the nervous systems of fruit flies? Uh, um, you don't, don't we just want to really swat them and get them to, to go away from us? Is this really important? Um, but what, you know, what really is innovative here and what's important is that uh, there's many advantages of, of Drosophila and other organisms, but especially Drosophila as a model uh, for studying the basis of human um, disease. That there's, I don't know if Ming is going to go through this, but it has to do with the, you know, the rapid uh, um, um, rate of reproduction of Drosophila, uh, the many uh, years and, and you know, um, thousands and thousands of investigators who have studied Drosophila that have, have gained great insight into uh, um, a lot of fundamental biological processes, and there's already been, been many major advances in, in understanding uh, of human biology um, through uh, the study of, of Drosophila as a you know, very small uh, model organism. And, you know, and, and Ming is really extending that by not only using it to study human physiology, but also to the study uh, mechanisms of disease. 
Um, not surprisingly, given the, her many accomplishments, she's been recognized with a, a lot of different awards that are, that are too numerous, both locally and nationally, to, to mention. However, what I did want to mention is I think it uh, really uh, uh, shows uh, the high respect she has in her community is that she's ser currently serving as the uh, chair of the Board of Scientific Counselors uh, for the National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke. And, and that's a board that's set up by the, the institute that funds all of the research in this area um, at the federal level. And, and so they really you know, try to bring in, um, as their, their key advisors, the, the, the leading minds and the leading uh, um, uh, um, you know, thinkers in, the, um, in that broad field. And so for Ming to, to be selected as chair of that committee, uh, really guiding where all research is going at a national level uh, um, is quite a, a remarkable uh, um, accomplishment. Um, so I think I will stop there and, and welcome Ming. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Steve, for that kind uh, introduction. I'd like to start by thanking the committee uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak on this very interesting, uh, exciting uh, subjects. And I, this area is near and dear to my heart because I have both clinical interest as well as research interest on aging and brain degenerative diseases. Now, aging requires uh, no uh, introduction. It is a process of getting old, including physical changes, mental changes, as well as social changes. What I want to tell you about is aging uh, is really uh, the ultimate equalizer it is inevitable, and it affects everyone, regardless of who you are, where you are, and what do you do. Um, today, I'd like to tell you about the goal of successful aging, that is to say, healthy aging, that we retain a healthy status until the death. I'm gonna tell you the science behind it and then the challenge we face. The idea of immortality is nothing new. As a matter of fact, this dream can be found in many different cultures over thousands of times. One example is illustrated here in a, uh, in a painting done um, in 1546 by a German artist. Uh, so people dreamed of an elixir here that uh, people can drink or bath into it which can restore their, their longevity and vitality. So people come in here and came out feeling really rejuvenated. Um, the similar dream occurs in multiple other cultures. One example um, is in China, in ancient China. So what it is is they practice a type of alchemy in that they generate a, a complicated situation and they generate something which is in the solid form. This form is called dan. You know, so, so it's like practice then. However, this is largely restricted for empires rather than the previous slides. Despite the dreams of um, immortality, these compounds actually are not that good because they contain heavy metals, probably <laughs> led to an ac accelerated death and shortened lifespan. After thousands of years of failure, and the prevailing view was that aging is inevitable. I held this view uh, for a long time myself. Therefore, extending lifespan was ludicrous and considered crazy. I don't know how many people here still think so. Raise your hand. Well, I guess you don't want to raise your hand because obviously <laughs> there's something I'm about to tell you. So the view of inability to extend lifespan is deeply rooted and is based on the following idea. The idea is our body undergo wear and tear, just like a car. So you have a new car first, after years of usage, it's just wear and tear until it dies. If you don't have a car or don't own a car, so it's sort of like a pair of old shoes, okay? But no matter how comfortable it is, it ultimately breaks down. So aging also attracts a lot of scientists in this area for obvious reasons. Over the years, there are two, two kinds of theories that explains aging that are put forth. One type is uh, damage-based theories. So basically it says uh, our body accumulate kind of damage or toxins, both internally and externally, and ultimately you sort of fall apart. 
So one such theory, is, for example, is DNA damage theory. That means the DNA in your body is subject to UV, UV lights and some internal toxins, then that prevents renewal and repairing of a lot of cells, including your stem cells. And in the end, these cells die, you lack ability to repair. Another theory is a free radical theory. That means there are side products of your oxidation. oxygenation. Life requires oxygen. This is inevitable. And the side product is something called reactive oxygen species that accumulates in the body over a period of time. That causes damage in your body. Another theory is called telomere theory. Telomere theory, a telomere is one part of the chromosome on your tip. So with each division and the chromosome, which is the, the body that your DNA is on, shortens with each division. Therefore, that we only have limited cell division. So capacity, in the end, you ran out of division, so you can't divide, so we age. These theories are all have some truth in them. However, today I hope to tell you a new set of ideas that says aging is also a programmed, uh, has also, also a programmed component that is under genetic control. I will elaborate this later. First, let's talk about what is really aging, what is really lifespan. Uh, lifespan is usually utilized in this type of chart. The x-axis says aging with time. So here's the birth, here's the death. And the y-axis says percentile of uh, people that survive. So of course, at zero point, you have 100% survival. As time go on, you reach the death. So um, normally, so we have a steady uh, state and then have a rapid decline and leading to, self, uh, leading to death. And our goal, obviously, to extend um, this curve to show a different shape. So there's two important concepts. One is a maximum lifespan, meaning how the, the maximum you can live. Another very important is the mean lifespan, meaning at the, when 50 percent of people die, what is, you know, what is really the age? So you look at 50 percent, and then you see what is the age. So these are the two important concepts. So the mean lifespan, uh, you know, so maximum lifespan, we, we think that you know, it, it may not have changed that much, although for the earlier stage, it certainly depends on the record keeping. However, the mean lifespan made tremendous, dramatic changes over time. For example, in Africa, 50,000 years ago, the curve, it's sort of like this shape. Um, the early death is largely attributed to starvation, predation, you know, eaten by a lion or something, as well as early death. So in Europe, about 15,000 years ago, so this is roughly about 10 years old, and 15,000 uh, 15, uh, years ago, this I think is roughly about uh, you know, 20 some years old. And in 1000 BC, the uh, life ex uh, mean life expectancy increased to close to 40 years old. But a dramatic change happens in modern days where we have in uh, 1970 in the US, this is roughly 70 some years old. So, what is really the maximum longevity that we have in humans? Um, the current record keeper is a woman, a French woman, um, by the name Jean Camant, who lived at the age of 122 and a half, okay? <laughs> so she inspired all the fascination of us, probably everybody, because we want to know her secret of longevity. So she, from what I've read, because I've never gotten the chance to talk to her, from what I read, she's neither an athlete nor a health fanatic, okay? But there are several remarkable things about her. One is she took up fencing at the age of 85. And she continued to ride bicycles until she's 100 years old. She was 100 years old. Remarkably, she started smoking very young in her 20s and quit smoking at the age of 11, uh, 111, uh, 18, 19. So some people speculate, maybe it's the smoking. <laughs> okay, all right. So also, there's a lot of anecdote stories about her. 
So there was one story, it's about usually during her birthdays, there will be a lot of journalists interviewing her on her birthday. There's one occasion, one journalist said, well, I hope that I'll see you next year. And then uh, what she said was, well, you seem to be very young. There's no reason that you cannot make it <laughs> next year. Yeah. So now let's look, what is the limitation of this maximum lifespan? Why our life ends? And that is to say, you know, why we die. Here it listed in 2013 the 10 most uh, leading causes of death in the United States. So this is our 10, including heart disease, cancer, lung disease. There's also accidents and suicide here. And stroke, which is also a type of uh, cardiovascular disease together with lung disease, Alzheimer's disease is right there, diabetes, and among others. We like to call these diseases, some disease, diseases of aging. So this include cardiovascular disease, including heart disease and stroke, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, which is gonna be my focus, and diabetes. So these cases rise dramatically with aging. Before I dive into the neurodegenerative disease, just want to show you an example of cancer. Here is the age on the uh, x-axis, and y age is the number of cases that a patient have. As you can see, uh, listing two uh, common, disease, common cancer, one is breast cancer and colon cancer, the prevalence of the disease increased dramatically with aging. We are obviously working in the biomedical sciences as well as um, healthcare, we work very hard. So if you look at from 2000 to 2013, death due to cancer, heart disease, stroke, and also HIV, so declined dramatically. However, there is one death that increased for more than 70%. That is says we made uh, great progress in a lot of other diseases, but we're making no progress in the front of actual therapeutics in Alzheimer's disease. As a matter of fact, the death due to Alzheimer's disease increases. So before I dive in to tell you about Alzheimer's disease, let me just tell you the concept of age-related neurodegenerative diseases as a whole. So this, group, this is a group of disorders that cause progressive loss of structure or function and ultimately the death of neurons, neurons meaning your nerve cells. So the two of the most common neurodegenerative diseases, which is also my focus of research, is Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit later. Beyond these diseases, there's also a long list of diseases. Some of them are listed here. They include ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, frontal temporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, Huntington's disease, and spinal cerebellar ataxia, all of which are bad disease. Let me tell you a little bit about Alzheimer's first. Alzheimer's disease presentation has two components. One is the cognitive impairments, another is behavior problems. Cognitive impairments, we all know, most of us all know, that Alzheimer's disease affects memory. However, it is very important to note Alzheimer's disease affects a lot of other cognitive domains, including language deficits. They cannot comprehend or come up with languages towards the end or at the beginning. They have visual spatial impairment. They get lost in their home, uh, which they could be living for the past 30 years. And they also couldn't make it to their bathroom. They forgot how to put on a, a dress, a, you know, a, a dress themselves, which if you think about, takes a lot of you know, spatial, uh, spatial skills. Executive dysfunctions, they, forgot, they forget about how to dial the phone or how to pump gas. Personality changes, they become highly irritable for most of the cases. In addition, they have behavior problems which, which pose enormous uh, difficulty for caregivers to take care of them. The extraordinarily anxious, depression, um, apathy, hallucination, they see things that are not there, sometimes it's fearful, delusion, they always think CIA is chasing them, or their spouse have fidelity, uh, you know, uh, infidelity, 
So those are the things. And, and then they a lot of times have sleep problems in that they wake up in the middle of the night hiding a knife you know, uh, underneath their pillow or set up fires. So this really sometimes triggers their entry into the nursing home. Ultimately, Alzheimer's leads to a profound brain atrophy, not just memories. So here is a, a, a pathology sample, meaning after, you de after the person is dead, you harvest the brain, you look at them. That provides a lot of insight. On the left-hand side is the healthy brain, um, and then the right side is advanced Alzheimer's brain. As you can see, there's tremendous amount of atrophies. And then this ultimately leads to a total failure of brain function much more beyond, uh, beyond memory. So in the end, they have difficulty swallowing, they cannot talk, um, they cannot get out of the bed, and it's a, it's a difficult and sad disease. Okay, after we, uh, we talked about that, who wants to get Alzheimer's disease now? Raise your hand. Nobody? Okay, let me ask, rephrase the question. Who wants to get Alzheimer's when you are 85 years old? Raise your hand. I don't see anybody, okay? So, however, if I tell you Alzheimer's disease is actually the most common neurodegenerative diseases, affecting 50% of the people over the age of 85, that is to say, with our expansion of lifespan, all of us are expected to, leave, uh, to live till the age of 85, and half of us will be demented with Alzheimer's disease. So before I go on, I'd like to clarify a term because I got asked quite often. So what is the relationship between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? What is really dementia? Dementia is an umbrella term for loss of multiple cognitive functions. In other words, dementia is a general term. Under the umbrella of dementia, there are multiple causes. Here, I only listed several of them, including Alzheimer's dementia, Parkinson's dementia, vascular dementia, this is after stroke or some other causes, Lewy body dementia and frontal temporal dementia. When we talk about Alzheimer's disease, there's a term that we usually used, it's, it's really devastating. Why do we commonly use this word devastating? For several reasons, because the brain is really the essence of our humanity. We, we use brain to communicate. Language is such an important tool to communicate. In the end, this is impaired. And also, your brain is really where you control your emotions. When you say, I'm heartbroken, your heart is not broken, okay? So your heart is actually fine. It is your brain that suffers. And memory is so important because your life is really accumulation of your memory with your loved ones, with your personal experience. Your, your brain is really where your identity comes from. And for a scientist, creativity, and then for the artist and everybody else is very important. In addition, obviously, your brain controls your vision, in addition to your eyes, of course, then controls your movement, perceived sensations. Really, the brain is essence of humanity. To threaten that is very scary. Another thing is, Dementia is a, is a disease that removes our independence, that leads to enormous burden to the family. For people who have a family member who has dementia, you, will, you can relate this very closely. What is really the challenges to conquer this disease? One, one major event is that there's limited repair and re, uh, regrowth in what we usually call the central nervous system, which can, <coughs> contains brain and the spinal cord. As opposed, this is obviously oversimplification, as opposed to liver, like if you cut half of your liver, no problem that you're gonna grow back because it has enormous regeneration potential. However, if you hurt your neurons, your brain or your spinal cord, it is very difficult to regenerate. That is why Christopher Reeve was still in a wheelchair until his death. Another troubling, well, I shouldn't say troubling, obviously it's a great thing, is the population is aging rapidly. The population of people aged over 60 or above is increased both in developing countries and developing countries. As you can see, this curve illustrates. Um, by the prediction is that by the end of 2050, we would have two billions of people in the world who will have 
you know, over the age of 60. And worse, there is no treatment that can halt the, uh, halt the progression of the neurodegenerative disease. There are certain treatment that can sort of make the symptoms better, but nothing can halt the progression of the disease. After all, that I feel this is really a public health crisis. Take Alzheimer's disease as an example. Right now, there are 5.4 million of Americans who have the disease. By 2050, the number would increase to 16 million. So we will have completely overloaded nursing homes, caretakers, the healthcare system that would overtax federal and state budget. It is really a major problem. The question is, I ask myself, as well as a lot of people in the field, is how to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease, other neurodegenerative disease, and other age-related disorders. So one common strategy that we're using, that we're still using, including myself, is to work on individual diseases. Our cardiologists working on heart disease, neurologists working on Alzheimer's, some working on this disease and that disease, cancer biologists working on cancer, so this strategy perhaps can be illustrated here. Like we're doing research and treating disease one, uh, one at a time. It's sort of like a car analogy. It's we can replace old parts one at a time. So for example, right now we're making great progress. If you have a joint problem, no, no problem. We'll just replace your joint. If you have a liver problem or heart problem, we can transplant, right? However, I want to tell you, while we're making progress, let me just remind you of this. While we're making progress in any, a lot of other diseases, the Alzheimer's disease continued to improve. Why is that? That is to say, brain is really difficult. It poses a significant, unique challenges. What are the challenges? Brain is here, and it's really our weakest link that is here. We are really are the weakest link. It is really the weakest link that kills us, right? No matter the rest of your body, your heart and, and your joints and everything is perfect, but if you have a bad brain, you either die or become demented. None of them are, is good. Our understanding of the brain is really, we understand the least of the brain, and there's no cure to, for any of these neurodegenerative diseases, and we can't even stop the progression, although there's certain treatment to help families and you know, social support and behavior management, nothing can stop the progression. Then how to really find a cure? Another strategy is to say delayed aging itself, as aging is the strongest risk factor for a lot of these disorders. Let's take Alzheimer's disease, for, uh, for example. Here are the instances, meaning each year how many cases are uh, newly developed. This is the prevalence, meaning how many cases overall that we have. So the presence of Alzheimer's disease increase exponentially, as you can see. I mean, the statistics really says that the disease, prevalence of disease doubles every five years. Once you reach the age of 65, you, you entered an, an accelerated phase of developing the disease. So if the prevalence of the disease doubles um, every five years, what does that tell us? That tell us that age is by far the st strongest risk factors. I frequently got asked, oh, you study Alzheimer's disease, so what, is, what can I do? What is the strongest risk factor? Unfortunately, the strongest risk factor is aging. So on the flip side of it, so to cut the disease burden by 50% is fairly uh, you know, in a way, if you can envision, potentially achievable, is that you only need to delay the disease onset by five years. Okay. How do we do that? How do we delay aging? I think this is, you know, it's crazy, isn't it? I just told you. Let me just digress a little bit and tell you a, a, a story during my graduate days. I went to graduate school uh, in San Francisco at UCSF. This is 1993, and I uh, was uh, learning genetics from a fantastic professor by the name Cynthia Kenyon. She's very enthusiastic, 
So really draw my attention to study the subject of genetics, which I'm still studying, <laughs> as you can see. She works on a, 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 an organism called C. elegans, or in another, word, in another word, it's just worms. So it's a tiny little worm about one millimeter long, but nevertheless is a great model organism. So the worm usually live for about two weeks. At the time, Cynthia Canyon asked the question whether we could extend the lifespan of these worms when she introduced gene mutations. Initially, as you can see, she was faced with a lot of you know, uh, skepticism, including myself, as I've told you, based on the history of it, thousands of years of failure. However, it's amazing that she actually succeeded and I'm convinced that she and others will probably ultimately uh, awarded, uh, be awarded Nobel Prize. So what she found is illustrated here. So here is the aging curve again. Here's the age um, as time go on, but this is all in worms, okay? So here is the fraction of alive. So uh, at the zero point, you have 100% um, uh, worms living. They usually die, you know, sort of like the mid midpoint is roughly about 14 days. So this is the, uh, the normal worm. As time go on, they die. And, and then by you know, a certain time, they all die. When she made a mutation of a single gene that with the rest of the gene are intact, the worm lives twice as long. OK, so not only that, this one gene mutation remind you that with all the other genes intact, double the maximum lifespan. So rather than live 14 days, the, the worms usually lives about 30 days. And then also increase the mean lifespan. In addition, these worms move, you know, this is, you know, what we can, we can't talk to the worms, but, you know, they move very readily, in, in indicating that, that they have also a health lifespan. So without going to details, many, you know, Thousands of people started working on this field, that they ultimately, what people find longevity is really related to something called insulin receptor dependent nutrient sensing. We, of course, can have another lecture talking about this, but uh, this ultimately activates a stress responses. So this work really struck me deeply. So I remember at the time hearing her lecture, I was in a deep shock. I was just couldn't go to sleep at night because this is just challenged what I always thought. As a Chinese, we tend to think about fate, right? I mean, age is just what you, you know, what happens, you know, that, you know, who can change aging by doubling of that? Then I'm just thinking, what does that mean? So if it's in people's term, that means essentially, like if you see an elderly gentleman, you ask, how old are you? He might say, 170. So if you see a middle-aged woman, you ask, how old are you? She may say, 100 years old. So this is what, what it means. Of course, you know, I'm extrapolating from these worm study, but that's a very, very, very interesting aspect. And what does that mean when we come back to think about aging? That aging is really under genetic control that can be manipulated by altered function of a single gene. And there is really an intrinsic aging program, program in each worm. So this is not something, an elixir outside. It's something you have within yourself. Of course, the key question is, does this only work in worms, right? Or is this a sort of idiosyncrasy of worms? So the answer is no. This mechanism is actually conserved. What does that mean? That means this is seen in many other organisms, including fruit flies which is a, a research model organism, mice, and to a certain extent, humans. Because in the human centenarians, there is a disease, there is a gene variant along this pathway that confers um, a longevity for, for people to live over the age of 100. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is the fountain of youth actually exists within the animal itself. I was also just shocked to see that previous dreams of thousand years now can partially realize in animals through science. Isn't this amazing? Amazing. I was very excited. <laughs> now the next question is, 
are there any other pathways that controls aging? Is this the one pathway or multiple pathways? It turns out there are multiple pathways. One pathway has something to do with mitochondria, which is an organelle in the body that is illustrated here. Now, mitochondria is something that we think about. It's a powerhouse of the cell, provides energy to, uh, for us to function. Particularly, the brain requires a higher amount of energy, as you can imagine, sometimes as high as a quarter of the energy. Mitochondria also is quite unique because it has its own DNA. It's called mitochondria DNA, or abbreviated as mtDNA. So damaged uh, mtDNA accumulates with aging. This is an uh, important uh, observation that people have found for uh, uh, several years. However, the question is, is the accumulation of mtDNA damage the driving force for aging? The answer is yes. A key experiment comes from here. So what happens is one can genetically manipulate mice so that they can have increased damaged mutated mitochondrial DNA. Without going into details, this what lab has actually made it happen. On the left-hand side, you see an image of a wild-type mice who usually live till two to three years. This is common in the lab situation. However, when people make uh, mitochondrial DNA, this is particular, is called mutator mice, that this mice live much shorter, it's only one year. In addition, when you look at this uh, age-matched uh, stage, that they uh, demonstrated a lot of signs of premature aging. They have reduced fertility, they lose hair, they have curved spine, as you can see, the heart has problems, have in, uh, enlarged heart, osteoporosis, uh, uh, in edema, and so on and so forth. That just says the increased mtDNA mutation drive the process of aging. Without going into details, there, are, there is a growing body of literature on the role of mitochondria and aging. So this is really a, a very exciting area of research. Now, the question is, is there a direct connection between mitochondria and neurodegenerative disease, as I said. The strongest link comes to uh, the study of Parkinson's disease. Actually, in my lab, is well, one of the uh, first two labs in the world that make this uh, connection. Let me just now tell you a little bit about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease, affecting 5% of people over the age of 80. So here, we would have probably you know, 10 people here will get Parkinson's disease. The pathology of Parkinson's disease is known that one striking pathology is the degeneration of a group of neurons called dopamine neurons in the areas of midbrain. So this is if you cut the cross section, here's where, where, the, uh, where the midbrain is at. So another way to look at it is if you take a brain, like cut your brain like a loaf of bread, but of course don't try this at home. <laughs> So, and then you flip it around, it, the midbrain is here, then you superimpose onto an MRI cross-section. Here is really your eyeballs, here's your nose, this is the back of your brain, here's where the uh, dopaminergic neurons are located at. Because of lack of dopaminergic neurons, the treatment um, is dopamine replacement. This, again, alleviates certain symptoms, but does not uh, stop the progression of the disease. So what are these symptoms? Let me just give you an example of two patients that we see on the left-hand side. They're, they have these resting tremor. Also, this is an action tremor. Looking at their facial expression, they have something called mask faces, a positive facial expression, and this is resting tremor. And then I sometimes, we sometimes ask patients to tap his fingers as fast as you can. You can try it on. Make sure there's no slowdown. <laughs> you don't need to come and see me. So again, slowing down. On the right-hand side, we ask the patient to draw a single line in between these, so write his names, and a single line in between these spirals. On the left-hand side, you still see this asymmetric um, shaking uh, tremor of the hand and also have difficulty walking. Then the patient also have muscle stiffness. And the, this, we ask the right-hand side, we ask the patient to draw a single line in between these uh, parallel lines. Again, 
he has tremendous difficulty uh, accomplishing the task, we then ask patient to pour the water from one container in the other. It's very difficult. As you can imagine, this would severely impair the patient's ability to carry out daily functions. Um, you can imagine when the patient would have difficulty eating and so on, writing. These group of symptoms called motor symptoms, this is not, this is really at the mid, mid, age, mid stage, it's not even at the late stage. At late stage, they're invariably bedridden, cannot accomplish a lot of activities. In addition, the patient also have a variety of non-motor symptoms, including some psychiatric features, depression, anxiety, um, you know, compulsive disorders, as well as some other symptoms outside of the nervous system. 30 to 40 percent of patients develop dementia. Now, we do have one type of treatment, although this treatment is not really uh, great initially for the first five years, like a honeymoon period of time. It works great, but later the effect declined and only some of the symptoms can be treated, other symptoms may be more debilitating, so we really need to uh, have a, a cell-based understanding of the disease beyond the, the dopaminergic neurons. How do we do that? Fortunately, uh, over the past almost 20 years, several genes that mutated can cause familial Parkinson's disease. Overall, this group of, uh, a group of familial forms is composed roughly about 10% of the cases. This uh, creates an exciting and unique opportunity for us to really ask the question, what is really uh, Parkinson's disease? And my lab has been working on this for, uh, for several genes, including pink parking, which I'm gonna focus on then, as well as some other diseases. The key question we asked, is, uh, we asked are, what goes wrong in these Parkinson's cases at the cellular level, and can we do something to treat it? In my lab, um, I, we work on multiple organisms. Um, fruit flies is one key uh, organisms, as well as tissue culture cells and human cells and mammalian cells, and we also in collaboration with others to study mice. Of course, human are uh, one, of the, one of the setup as well. So, you know, looking at this, people can understand, but looking at, uh, looking at fruit flies, this is people are, 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 are having uh, difficulty. However, uh, just like my patient says, doc, you're looking at Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, great, work faster, okay? So when they say we are working on fruit flies, why? So the question is, why do we use fruit flies to study human diseases? It is uh, interesting to think that 70%, 75%, of human disease genes actually have fly counterparts. In other words, biological pathways are largely conserved, meaning they function at the, the similarly from the building block standpoint. And uh, flies we can study at the level of real animals versus a tissue culture, and it's very easy to study something called the genetic screen and feed them compounds. There, there, are, uh, there is century-long accumulation tools ever since the beginning of uh, 1900. So at the time, there are many people studying many organisms, grasshoppers, earthworms, you name it, they have it. There's only one animal who survived this long time, which is fruit flies. There's obviously a lot of advantages, but there's also a century-long accumulation tools. And there's rapid generation of time, uh, rapid generation time. If you take a boy fly and a girl fly, you put them together, 10 days later you have baby flies. So you, <laughs> then you can work very fast. Particularly as related to Parkinson's disease, these models, the phenotype, meaning the, the pathology we see is very strong and, and then is very consistent. So the question that you may say, well, flies fine, but you know, there are flies, they, they only fly and they eat and perhaps mate, you know, what else do they do? Flies are actually not that different from, uh, from us. Obviously, they development, a lot of fundamental development principles are first identified in flies and subsequently found to be conserved in humans. Flies can have cancer growth, okay? Here, as you can see, the flies, they have some ugly tumors growing out of their back, and here. Flies obviously can undergo aging, and the mechanism is conserved, as I've told you. Flies can sleep, and <laughs> flies can learn. They have learning and memory. 
flies are, uh, can be very aggressive, particularly the male flies. If you put two male flies on the platform, one will be determined to fight the other one out, okay? However, when you put two female flies there, do they fight for the male or the others? No, they fight for food. Okay. <laughs> okay. So flies also have circadian rhythms, like what we have, you know, day and night rhythms. As a matter of fact, the first gene that controls circadian rhythm that is conserved in all animals was identified in, in flies. Fly can experience pain, have a characteristic wound healing. They can actually abuse alcohol and cocaine. They also have innate immunity. Sometimes I got so excited, I got carried away. I think maybe when I, one day I walk into the room, I'll see a fly <laughs> reading New York Times. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so what does flies really look like and how do we actually see it? Let me give you a visual example. Um, this is actually my mom <laughs> who's in the audience. Now, this is how we look at flies, and we were obviously looking at under a microscope. And you can see if you look at flies, they'll fly away. How do you do that? You take a plate, then you pass CO2 to it, and then the, fly, the flies will be temporarily anesthetized. And you look at the flies, and afterwards you put them back, and then they regain consciousness, okay? So this is how we store flies. My mom um, actually is not a biologist, uh, let alone a fly biologist. <laughs> She's a retired chemistry professor. So when I started my lab, I really need hands. I wanted to go, go to work, go work. So uh, my mother, as with probably a lot of Chinese can relate here, is the perfect mom. So, <laughs> so she gave me enormous support during the day. She cooked me dinner and cleaned my house and did my laundry. At night, I felt very guilty of going to the lab, you know, leaving her there. Then finally, we just said, why don't we go to the lab together? <laughs> so fly, when you study flies, it's different from molecular biology, because molecular biology always get confused when I talk, adding things to the wrong tube. But in flies, you can listen to radio, you can talk without any problems. So I can train my mom to work on some simple fly work. <laughs> so one thing is really, really important is if you want to bond with your mother or your parents, <laughs> Fly work is really the way to go. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to what we say. So what we wanted to do is to look at what happens in, um, in the pink one mutant flies. So this is an, uh, what we see. What well, we see that flies, in particular this is a tissue in the muscle. Here's the wild type flies and here's the pink one mutant flies. So here's the, under the light microscope and here's under the electron microscope. In light microscope, you can see these muscle fibrils uh, have a regular banding. And then when the mutant, they have these vacuolations indicative of death. Under the microscope, the wild type flies has this densely packed cristae as mitochondria, whereas in pink one mutant, um, they, are, uh, they have a lot of problems. This is a, a cell death process. Without going into details, we found that two of these five or six genes actually function together that to controls mitochondrial integrity. The question is, which aspect of mitochondrial integrity, uh, which, uh, which aspect of mitochondria to this pathway regulate? So, um, you know, so what we found is a process that mitochondria is not really uh, uh, static. They sometimes fuse and then two merged into one, and they sometimes fizz, one split into two. This process, of course, is under the genetic control. What we found is in the wild type, you know, the tissue is normal. In the pink one mutant, uh, there's tissue degeneration, and the red signal says cell death. In this background, however, if we reduce this process of fusion, everything is, is, is reverted, not only to the cell base, and also animals are much more robust and healthy. So summarizing what we see is that pink parkin, two of the genes affecting Parkinson's disease actually acts through mitochondria, which is really amazing. And then they regulate the process of a fusion. So this is really a, a prettier way of looking at it, saying that pink parkin function in the common pathway that regulates this protein that mediates mitochondrial fusion, ultimately leads to tissue health. 
So there's certain implications regarding the downstream therapeutics. I have to go back to say whether we initially, this major finding was discovered in flies, are they really related to humans? Of course it is, because if we can take um, you know, the human genes that you and I have, needing you know, pink parkin and put that in flies, the, the, you know, the flies pathology can be alleviated, suggesting they carry out similar rules. And patients with these mutations, they're clinically also indistinguishable and show mitochondrial defects. Of course, other organisms show the same thing. Next, we asked, is there anything that we can do to find new th things that can suppress the pathology? This is really the pathology of this disease disease flies, and then in this background, if we could manipulate things, either compound or genetics, we want to see whether something can suppress that. Lo and behold, we found one. So this one is a, a gene, so here is the wild type, meaning the you know, normal. This is the pink one mutant with tissue damage, cell death, and bad mitochondria. In this background, if we do a certain one gene manipulation, all of the uh, pathology can be removed. So there's a lot of work um, went into this, but I just want to tell you not only this whole thing happens in flies with a collaboration with others, it also happened in mouse. So in mouse, we take the neurons from their brain and you know, so look at you know, the wild type. Uh, this is just if we look at this gene called MAL1, nothing happens, just look at Parkin, nothing happens, but if we remove both of them, they showed a tremendous amount of neurodegeneration. Here's a different view of looking at this red signal, which is mitochondria, and then in a, in a, in, when we remove both of these genes, the pathology is much more severe. So without going into detail, let me just give you the gist of the story. Uh, without going into technical detail, what we are finding is there are really a parallel pathway. There's you know, they are impinging on one key molecule that mediates mitochondrial fusion. So this pathway occurs in both flies as well as in mice, as well as in human cells, and it remains to be seen whether we'll also see that in humans. Um, but what important is the small one because when it over a tweak, when we tweak it up, it can suppress all the pathology of the flies. So we're very excited to also doing a chemical screen to mediate this. So another way to look at our finding is to say that, you know, when the, with the pink Parkin, Parkinson's disease, you know, uh, flies, they have some mitochondria is not functioning so great as they're yellow. If we can, adding this, comp this, this gene manipulation, we can completely make the, you know, the, the mitochondria much healthier if we remove um, this gene, and they're much more severe. So this, this protein that we found out called MAL1 level is crucially important for mitochondrial quality, and this is a potential therapeutic target that we're very excited about. So overall, um, you know, over the past, you know, uh, almost 10 years, the pink parking field undergo enormous explosive studies that people now found that th these two things are potentially involved for a process called mitochondrial quality. As I've told you, mitochondria tend to have increased propensity to induce um, you know, uh, DNA damage and have poor quality. So pink parking seems to be this in very important machinery to survey the damaged mitochondria and ultimately eliminate that. Here's to say in a wild type, you have a certain pink one on the mitochondria. When the, when the mitochondria is bad, you have more pink one on mitochondria. And this pink one then attracts parkin coming in onto the mitochondria and elicit a process called autophagy, which ultimately engulf this bad mitochondria so that you can be free of bad mitochondria. So in other words, this group of genes, although initially identified in, in Parkinson's disease, mediates clearance of damaged mitochondria. To make things more exciting, that pink Parkin are also implicated in other age-dependent disease, including Alzheimer's disease, including cancer, because Parkin is also a tumor suppressor gene, heart disease, and diabetes. In other words, a lot of age-related diseases are involved 
you know, due to this potential quality control process. I just want to tell you our lab is also working because I'm a physician seeing patients, you know, looking at uh, patients we have worked on because this is something we call pedigree, meaning there are parents and have uh, four, it is four sisters, all of them are in Southern California, two of them have diseases and we are actually treating them and also surveying them. So this is the patient. I just want to make it clear that this is no HIPAA violation because patient <laughs> insists that we should promote her story because she wants people to know her story and she came to our lab, inspired us uh, to study her, so she told us her you know, suffering and so on also made us realize this is, this is really a human disease. Every day we do makes a difference. I also urge you to help me find these more pink parking patients, they tend to be early onset. Encourage them to contact me so that, you know, one thing is if we have any, any potential hints, we can associate with, uh, we can provide guidance and also potentially if they're interested in, um, in, in research subject. Let me just summarize what I've told you today. What I told you that prolonged lifespan is really a reachable goal through genetics and environmental factors. And the brain degeneration is a major public health crisis that we need to focus on. Pathways exist to induce longevity. I've told you one pathway that is nutrient sensing. Another pathway is mitochondria. And improving mitochondrial quality, this is also uh, uh, what motivates me to study, will help Parkinson's disease and likely other brain degeneration, diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. In other words, one sort of visual way of looking at it is as time go on, the incidence of age-related disease obviously go, go up and ultimately leads to divide, demise of us. And if we could delay this process, thinking about pulling this curve down, okay? If we pull this curve down, we're gonna cut this uh, incidence. Sometimes we say 30%, sometimes 50% of all these age-related diseases. The ultimately we'd like to think about is to is to sort of this is a, another way of looking at uh, you know uh, life form is initially this is as time go on this is the health and quality of life as time progress you know obviously you die if we could do something called rectangularization of lifespan meaning you have sustained health until one day you know we can't avoid death and then you die because a lot of times you ask people. People are not necessarily afraid of death, okay? Sometimes people accept that, but people really are afraid of suffering and pain and burden to their loved ones. Okay, I want to end by just talking about sort of uh, general is issues on how to successfully age and ward off Alzheimer's disease, right? This is what I got asked uh, a, a long time. So just want to ask a question. Actually, a group of people in the US that live 10 years longer and healthier, where is this place? Hawaii. Who knows? Yell out. Hawaii? Hawaii? Hawaii. Not quite. Another guess. Loma Linda? Loma Linda. Who said so? <laughs> great, great. Exactly right. It's actually in Southern California. OK. Not that far away from us, you know? <laughs> So it's Loma Linda. So what's there in Loma Linda? Okay. <laughs> uh, there are 22,000 uh, residents. A third of them belong to a Christian religious group called Seventh-day Adventist. So it turns out this is a concept of a blue zone. So when people did longevity studies, they surveyed the whole world, identified the pockets of um, society that, that people live longer and healthier in general, maybe 10 years longer. So these are in Okinawa and Japan here, and then in mountain villages of Italy, that sounds good, and in and one island in Greece, Loma Linda, as we said, and also in the, uh, one peninsula in Costa Rica. Then the question is, why do they live that long? You know, so, and what is the common factor? The common factor include, this is what people think, of course, you know, we don't really know, so by looking at the, the joint features is they have regular but moderate physical activities. So exercise matters. A plant-based diet, low caloric consumption, obesity, 
doesn't help, okay? No smoking. And in the Loma Linda, people don't drink either, okay? So relatively few stressors, which is hard to, to control anyways. Social and family engagement is very important. Now talking about Alzheimer's disease, what is the risk factors? The risk factor, the strongest risk factor is aging. I've told you, you know, a hundred times now. One bad thing for me is the female sex tend to have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. That's why I need to work hard. <laughs> Not only that, once you get Alzheimer's disease, the progression is much faster. Bad for us as a group of, you know, as women. Family history is very important, as you can imagine. Uh, you, if you have a condition called cognitive impairment, that's bad. Reduced mental and physical activities, of course, is not great. And low uh, educational attainment doesn't help. Vascular risk factors, including hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterol, obesity, smoking, is not good. So the, one of the things we think what is bad for your heart is bad for the brain. This is nothing not like dogma. This is only potential we can identify it, may be subject to change in future. Now, what is really decreased risk, because we want to ward off the disease? One is delaying aging, as I've told you. Not only it is dream, it is also a goal. And physical exercise, go to school for over 12 years. This is something you can tell your kids, motivate them. <laughs> Increase mental activities, that's why you're here in the lecture hall. Lifestyle for healthy heart, potentially Mediterranean diet, although exactly what is Mediterranean diet is still subject to debate. A little alcohol, questionable. Obviously, uh, you know, alcohol company wants you to, to do that. So what is good for the heart is possibly good for your brain. I want to ask one thing that I also commonly ask is many cognitive functions in your brain de decrease, uh, decline with age. That means processing speed, executive function, and memory. Although uh, recent important events that has no problems. We, we tend to have this tip of the tongue problem, saying the word finding problems. So it all seems to start declining at the age of 30, okay? Perhaps majority of us here. So we're all going a downhill. <laughs> so that sounds fairly pessimistic, but is there any cognitive function that improves with aging? What is it? Is there or there's none? No? Yes? We don't know. No. So people say, no, no. We're all going downhill. The answer is yes. So the, there's general knowledge that is improved with aging. Conventional wisdom that improves with aging. That's why you never see a president, no matter how fast thinking he is, it's the age of 20. Okay, of course, this is mandated by constitution. Because you need a certain wisdom that comes with age and vocabulary. So there are actually two types of intelligence. One type goes downhill ever since your early adulthood or mid-adulthood, but there is a type of intelligence going up consistently, you know, until the very end. So with the, with the uh, you know, delayed aging, I want to give you this picture to think about, that aging is not just a liability, okay? It seems like all the, the, the information that permeates society is age, is, it's just a liability, we're all going downhill. If we can accomplish healthy aging, particularly with brain health, I wanna make sure you don't wanna lose your brain, the elderly will provide an enormous resource and cumulative wisdom for society. You can imagine in future, you know, people, all these giants that can, can live longer, provide us with great wisdoms also, from a personal level, we can actually see our parents and our great parents and great grandparents and get all their wisdom if they have intact brain. Okay, so there's some hope, and this is our dream. So I want to acknowledge the people who have done the work. These are the people who uh, in our lab, without which nothing can be done. I only get the chance to talk, uh, you know, uh, about the work from. Some of, them, uh, some of them, more is coming. This is over the years, all these trainees in my lab. And here is the people, our collaborators, people allow us to use their reagents. And here's the funding sources without which nothing can happen. Thank you.
Thank you.